and you take a different approach, which is poverty is an optional and also direct result of the systems that that we've chosen. So can we start maybe with the conversation around poverty and how you approach it? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's disheartening to see how passive people have become about both domestic and international poverty. Because poor countries are getting richer faster than rich countries are getting richer, the rate of international inequality, which necessarily increased as with the Industrial Revolution as some countries began to get rich, leaving the others behind. Uh, but that has now turned a corner and international inequality is decreasing. Not too long ago, we discussed the Oxfam report on global inequality, which left us with this incredible fact. The richest 85 people in the world have more wealth than the bottom 50%. So, in other words, 85 people have more than 3 billion plus. 1% of the people in the general population have the overwhelming amount of money, and one-tenth of that 1% has almost all of that. That is mind-blowing. And you think, well, that's a terrible thing, and perhaps it is, but what you have to understand is that that law governs the distribution of creative production across all creative domains. Right? It's something like a natural law. And it shows you that the level of inequality that exists is not just like, hey, some people worked harder than other people and they just rose to the top. The cream always rises to the top. What happens when you play Monopoly? One person ends up with all the money because as you shovel money down, it tends to move right back up and it's a big problem. No, this isn't, this isn't a sporting event. It's not a pure meritocracy. Okay, and it's clear when you look at numbers like that. Oh, did those 85 people just work that much harder, gosh golly, than 3 billion plus? No, absolutely not. It would be ridiculous if you believe that. It's, a, it's an inevitable conclusion of iterated trading games, and we don't know how to fight it. We don't know how to take from the people who have and move it to the bottom without it instantly moving back up to the top. Different people, maybe, but still back up to the top. What's the, what's the answer? Dare I say it? Wealth redistribution. I just said it. What are your thoughts on resource-based economic philosophy of um, Jock Fresco and Peter Joseph? Peter Joseph is the zeitgeist guy, and he's, he's uh, way to the left of me. Um, right, Peter Joseph is the zeitgeist guy? I think he is. He's way to the left of me. I'm not that, I'm not that radical, man. I'm really not. I'm a, um, I believe in social democracy. I believe in, um, I, I call myself a populist. I believe in populist leftism. Populism means, uh, supporting policies that are good for ordinary people. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my thing is, I, I'm a libertarian leftist too, you could say, because on social issues, I'm very libertarian. Um, and on economic issues, I'm leftist. So I like, I do like the Scandinavian model. That's what I like. So the, anything that goes beyond that and is more communal and I, I don't know, I'm just, I'm not sold on that. And I also like a, a variation of direct democracy, constitutional direct democracy on some issues. So there's that. It's not just poverty that's the worst form of violence, as Gandhi stated. To be in a stratified system is against well-being and public health. Poverty is, in the words of Gandhi, the worst form of violence. <clears throat> Systemically speaking, it leads to so many different uh, detrimental outcomes, whether you're dealing with mental health, whether you're dealing with interpersonal relationships, of course, whether you're dealing with physical health. I'm curious to know your economic perspective. You have seldom commented on this topic other than saying that you wish taxes to be raised on the rich. What, in your view, are the moral highs and lows of free market and socialist economies? I understand this question may be oversimplified, but I would like any comments you have on this subject. This is from Dylan Grice. Well, you know, I actually have written a few blog posts on wealth inequality, mainly. To be more specific to your question, poverty is both a, a cause and an effect in terms of epidemiology. In social science research, people refer to poverty as a root of something. For example, 
Families in poverty are known to create children that have lower IQs. The brain function doesn't develop as, as well. There's reductions in the amygdala and the hippocampus. Literally, uh, your brain, you're creating brain damage through the, the synergy of poverty and deprivation. That's just one example. Mm. So that's so the left wing fails and the right wing don't care. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's fundamental. So we need to they find... also don't see the danger sufficiently. But it's also known as, a, as an effect, too, and that's why it's addressed in the book as such. I refer to it as a, a negative externality for those familiar with, familiar with economics. An externality is something that happens outside of the, the purview, the reference point of what economics recognizes. So pollution is a negative externality, for example, as is poverty. And that's a re pretty radical thing for me to say, because as you've pointed out, most people have not perceived it that way. And the right wing also tends to think that the spoils go to who deserves them. And those can be found on my blog. I think the first one is entitled, How Rich is Too Rich? I think that's the first one. Anyway, they're all sort of linked to one another. And I think I wrote about this back in 2010 or thereabouts. You know, I, I think wealth inequality is a real problem. And I think socialism is a, in the extreme, is a failed response to that problem. So what's going on here? Harvard's polling director told the Washington Post that the millennials he interviewed said capitalism was unfair and left people out despite their hard work. Well, yeah, it is unfair. That's kind of the idea. But if you're being left out despite your hard work, you probably need more capitalism, not less. The rate of international inequality, which necessarily increased as with the industrial revolution as some countries began to get rich, leaving the others behind. The people in the global south, in Africa, Latin America, Asia, and so on, that are still in destitute third world poverty are not there because they've been left behind. They're there because over the course of time they've effectively been robbed. And that's something that isn't given enough gravity of me in the intellectual circles as to why these things exist. Uh, you know, what I said about income inequality is a few things. Number one, the idea that the people who are very, very rich somehow stole from the people who are very, very poor, and that's why they're very, very rich is stupid. Poor people are poor and don't have lots of money to steal. Which makes you kind of upset when you hear people talk about how we've advanced poverty on this planet without talking about the fact that the reason poverty exists is because of the social system's incentives at the same time over the long term. Because I am concerned with inequality, say, and with social instability, and, I, and I've thought about it for a long time. I knew that the left-wing approaches tended to fail catastrophically, and the right-wing, of course, isn't particularly concerned with inequality. So. It's not to say we don't need a social safety net. I think we do, and I think we need an increasingly strong one. And the reason for that is, I think, ultimately, technology, if it works, will reduce the need for human labor in a way that uh, it never has quite accomplished before. Without a unified design approach to the economy, one that undoes the current system's structural intentions, only minor progress will occur. I think I mean, this, this now goes to the topic of artificial intelligence. Ultimately, if we manage to build truly labor-saving devices, you know, devices that don't simply just open up a space for new forms of human labor, but devices that actually cancel the need for human labor. And I think we're doing that. Then you really have this, the, the ultimate recipe for an intolerable degree of wealth inequality. And that as a consequence, those, those movements tend inexorably to become corrupt and destructive. Okay, so the idea that, if you, that Bill Gates got rich by ripping off a bunch of homeless people... Homeless people were not buying Microsoft, nor was he going to them, forcing Microsoft on them for them to stick into their boxes. Remember, the market economy's first priority is not to help the world, but to increase cost efficiency and profits. Right, like that's not how, that's not how he got rich. The way you get rich in any free functioning economy is by participating in an enormous number of voluntary transactions that benefit both sides. Therefore, profit, not social benefit, is what drives its efforts. The psychosocial stress, that we are killing each other through plaques in our arteries from the release of certain stress hormones that are directly attributed to socioeconomic inequality as well. Altered reward learning and hippocampal connectivity following psychosocial stress via neuroimage. Publication date, May 1st, 2018. Acute stress has a profound influence on learning as has been demonstrated in verbal learning or fear conditioning. I will try. So poverty and socioeconomic inequality kill about 18 million a year based on one estimate. So that is a couple 
couple holocausts in one year. They say the Soviet Union killed 100 million people in one century of its existence. We're killing in capitalist inequality, capitalist generated inequality, that many in six years. You should care about the question of poverty. You shouldn't care about the question of income inequality. So the defense of a class stratified society is, is no longer existent in the public health research.